So chapter five is more about bonding theories. We're going to investigate three different models of bonding and they will become increasingly complicated. The first one is just going to consider the idea of what molecular shapes happen as a result of the electrostatics between pairs of electrons. This is the VSEPR model, which because it takes so long to say VSEPR, most people just say VSEPR. You know, I think I'll call that a VSEPR. The other two models have uh, molecular shapes based on the atomic orbital arrangements about the central atom, and they are called valence bond theory and molecular orbital theory. But here's the most important thing. When do you use each of them? Because there are three different models because they operate in different situations and one will be preferred over another depending on what the situation is that you're using it. So let's talk about the VSEPR model. We're saying that molecules are essentially one central atom and then the other atoms are attached to it. When we have that situation, you're going to have very distinct geometrical shapes. And here are some of them. You could have methane. Now, this is a flat model. This is an example of what it looks like. Okay, so there it is. And if you think about it for a while, you'll realize that that is a tetrahedron where the outside atoms are the points, the vertices on the tetrahedron. Then we have, secondly, sulfur hexafluoride. You'll excuse that this does not have fluorines out here like it should. It should be a greenish color, but they're not, okay? It, however, the shape is right. The sulfur hexafluoride molecule, and if you look at it and you spin it around a little bit and think about it for a while, you'll see there's six of these out here, but what that looks like is actually an octahedron, which you have to think about for a while. But remember, the atoms are where the vertices are. So if I put my fingers where the vertices are, I can see that I have a total of six vertices. Eight sides, because the sides are these planes here. But I'm interested in the points, not the planes. And phosphorus pentachloride. All right, so there we go. There it is. If I twist it around, we can start examining that and see that two of these are out here like this, and the other three are around the equator. That's the way they consider it. Looks like it would have six sides. As a result, there are angles that appear. In the methane, all of the angles are this 109.5 degrees. In the sulfur hexafluoride, you could look at it and say, oh, each of these is a 90 degree angle. Every one of those is a 90 degree angle. But between this one and the one opposite it, you would have 180 degrees, and you could do that this way also, and that way as well, all 180 degrees. And then there's the confusing one, this guy, because these are 90 degree angles. That's a 180 degree angle. But if you look up the equator, those are 120 degree angles. It's a little harder to see when you have it just flat. If you have it in your hand and you can twist it around, you can see that it has to be 120 degrees. And those angles are always essentially the same. They're fixed. So when we were making up these Lewis structures, they're two-dimensional. They're flat on the paper. I call that a flat frog effect. Why do I say that? It's a really nasty thing to be thinking about. But first year that I taught this course, we had so much rain, the frogs came out. And then when I would walk back to my car across the parking lot, I would find all these flat frogs. The molecules themselves are not flat any more than the frogs didn't used to be flat. And if you flatten them down, you don't fully see what their shape is. It's not too bad when you talk about something that's linear. But if you talk about something that has a shape like this, it should actually look like this. Not 
two 90 degree angles and this 180. No, 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 they should be 120 degree angles. So what we had been done is Lewis had written all this as if it was flat on the piece of paper. So everybody was thinking about north, south, east, and west, right? When they're drawing, they're representations of the molecules. But in point of fact, that's not how they actually look. So what does VESPER, V-S-E-P-R, stand for? Valence shell. Okay, valence shell. Those were the electrons we were using to make up Lewis's structures, right? Electron pair. Okay, well, these are all electron pairs, right? If it's a bond, it's a pair of electrons. And here's a lone pair, clearly a pair of electrons from the name. And uh, repulsion. Oh, the electrons are all negatively charged and they do not want to be next to each other. They push away from each other. So when you put that into this, you realize it's going to form the molecular shapes by adding these rules for the bond angles based on the electron pairs repelling each other. If there's two areas of electrons here and here, they're going to try to get as far away from each other as possible. And the best way to do that is to get on absolutely opposite sides of the central atom. If I can get to opposite sides of that central atom, I am as far away from the other guy as I can be. And that's the same thing that's going on with the 120 degree. Instead of this, it should look like this because they're going to try to push apart. And the farthest they can get from each other is 120 degrees. Now, I also have a star on here. So let's talk about that. We're going to talk about, in particular, water. So if I have H2O, there it is, two H's and an O, right? This is water. This is the actual shape. Well, that's quite interesting because that's not what Lewis told us. When Lewis put it together on a piece of paper, it ended up looking like this because the oxygen came in with six. There's one, two, three, four, five, six. And the hydrogen came in with one, and this hydrogen came in with one. And so you got this, and it looked like a 90 degree angle on a piece of paper. Or if you were like, oh, no, 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 no. Let me put it like this. That'll look better, right? Then it looks like a 180 degree angle, neither of which is right. So we can look at this and see that's not it. So the two possibilities that we came up with, according to just doing a Lewis structure before Vesper, predicted bond angles like this, and they are not correct. So Vesper corrects that by saying, guess what? This is close to a 109 degree angle. It's not exactly that. Why? Let's look back at the Lewis structure. These are lone pairs. So when I look at the Lewis structure, I see here's an area of electron density, here's another one, this lone pair, and this lone pair. I have four areas of electron density, and they are trying to get far apart. Four, that's more like this. And we said this was 109.5 degrees between these. So why is it that I didn't say that it was 109.5 degrees? Well, because two of these areas of electron density are lone pairs. Two of them are in the bonds with the hydrogen, and they don't respond to each other exactly the same way. It's not quite the same. So these end up giving you slightly different numbers when they aren't exactly connected to the same sorts of things. All right. Now, I don't know if this model kit is quite good enough to show this, but I'll give it a try. These are at 120 degrees. This, I'm saying, should be less than 120 degrees. Is it lined up? Oh, yeah, it is less than 120 degrees, right? Okay, good, because it should be around 109. Let's dig in some more to the Vesper model. The electron pairs are going to repel each other and they're going to get as far apart as possible. So there are three rules. The first one is that these regions of electron density, they're gonna be either 
bonding or lone pairs. It does not matter. Either way, they're going to repel each other to try to minimize the amount of energy within electron-electron repulsion. So it's all about minimizing the energy of the shape. And here we have linear trigonal planar. That's this guy here. You can see that's a plane, right? It's all They're all in one plane, and there are three of them, and they're as far apart as they can get. The tetrahedral, that's the first one you get that is three-dimensional. The trigonal, because that's three, trigonal by, because there's two of these, and it looks like a pyramid on each. Here's a pyramid pointing up. Down here is a pyramid pointing down. Okay, so trigonal bipyramidal. And what is called the octahedral. And this is the one that everybody kind of gets confused by because I see six vertices, but it's not named for the vertices. It's named for the flat shape. So this eight-sided die represents the octahedral shape. It has six vertices and eight faces. I'm not holding you responsible for the pentagonal bipyramidal. It exists, but it's very rare. Now that you've actually seen it exist, that's enough for me. So.